I mean, listen, I love crocodiles. I don't want to, you know, put any fear into people regarding crocodiles, but when it comes to a big crocodile, yeah, I mean, that's one of the few animals in the wild that could totally look at a person. And if they're of the right size, meaning like, you know, 11, 12 plus feet, probably, you know, maybe bigger, depending on how big the person is, dude, you could be food and they, they will consume you and eat you and make a meal out of you. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm Pretty Intense. On the show today is someone that we know as the sexy vet. However, his name is Dr. Evan Anton. Uh, he has a book that came out called World Wild Vet. He has a huge Facebook show called Tusk to Tail. Look, if you want to know anything about animals, especially exotic animals, this guy loves crocodiles or crocodilians, I think he called them, which I did not know what that was. But apparently it's a conglomerate of all um, crocodile species and, and, and alligator species. You also are going to learn about his hobby, which I've already asked for an item from this hobby that he's taken up. I think this is going to be something that he's going to probably make a, a side or second or an extension of a career out of um, because he's very talented at it. And uh, I also learned that I'm now going to give driving lessons. So we have a lot of similar interests. So I hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, I, lo I love animals, but I especially love dogs. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, I love dogs. So we got, we got our dog. Show me. Dog me today. He's a little wolf, you could say. Mm, oh, you're not, but you could be. <laughs> I mean, you know, the littler, the bigger the bark. He, he thinks he's a wolf at times. I mean, I can say that at least. Yeah. Um, well, you got to be careful a little bit in LA for animals, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know. We, I hear coyotes around here every once in a while. I've never seen anything like in my, in my yard or property, but yeah, anytime I let them out at dusk, dawn or nighttime, I'm a little, I'm, I'm babysitting them outside. Like I'm out there with them. Aww. We have skunks more than ever, anything though. I mean, these skunks here are so trigger happy. I feel like it's been once a week lately, at least, that they're, I'm just like smelling skunk in my house. It's crazy. They're so busy <laughs> around here. That's and they gross. Just, yeah, it's kind of intense. I mean, it's cool to see them. Like, I love seeing skunks running around the yard and just being a part of the, you know, the nature and the, you know, they are one of the native species here. But man, sometimes they make the house smell pretty funky. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I mean, I get that. I mean, look, I'm not going to probably see a skunk running around and think quite as excited as you, but I would love <laughs> to see like in Arizona here, we get like javelinas. Um, uh, oh yeah. 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 Coyotes. Um, you know, those kinds of things, lots of rabbits and my dogs just go crazy for the rabbits, the rabbits yeah. are true obsession of theirs. Um, but then even like in other places that I've lived too, I remember I lived in North Carolina and, um, it was on a really, really big property and there were deer on it. And for a hot second, who I was living with was thinking that they'd let someone hunt them. And I was like, if you ever want to see deer on this property, you can't kill them. Yeah. And also please don't kill them. I know, right? So, um, anyway, there was like a deer stand in the in the in the in the back, but I there was no hunting going on. But I love seeing the animals roam around. It's like we are totally in their space. North Carolina has phenomenal wildlife. I mean, they've got neat reptiles, they've got alligators, they've got all kinds of cool mammals and birds and birds of prey, and really neat snakes. And actually, I wanted to go to vet school there for a minute because they've got a good program. But then I was so excited by the wildlife, and I know there's you know good beaches and some surfing there, and it seemed like a pretty cool spot to live, actually. Yeah, it was really nice. But you, um, so you love crocodiles, right? Is that your favorite animal? Yeah, love crocodilians. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, would you call them? Well, so I said crocodilians. Yeah, what'd you so call that me, what is that? That basically encompasses anything that's in that crocodile family. So it's alligators, crocodiles, mm -hmm. gharials, and caimans. Everything. Have you ever heard of a Gary? You ever seen those really long snouted, narrow snout, like a really long skinny snout on a crocodile? They're native to, it's called a Gary. They're native to like India and Nepal. No, dude, I don't see any of those things. I've run. <laughs> no way. Have you ever see, okay, so this was a good place they were represented kind of because they're kind of mo like a modern day dinosaur. They've been around for, you know, ten, probably hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. And there was a character that resembled pretty much a Gary in one of the Ice Age movies. It was like what this like. I, don't, I also don't watch any um, 
I don't watch anything that is a uh, cartoon or anything like that. No. What about I'm like one of those that's like, I'd be punishing to have like kids and have to watch like cartoons. I'd be like, <laughs> I'm watching like, you know, spiritual videos on, you know, the shadow self and, you know, I don't know, the hero's journey and quantum physics. Okay. I right. just have, I just, so no, I didn't, but I love animals. If you're going to watch a cartoon, maybe you should watch Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty? You ever heard of that? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's like the, the creators are t obviously total science nerds, and they're always doing this funny time travel. It's pretty funny. It's, huh. it's a pretty renowned, pretty, it's an adult cartoon. Okay. So if you, if you ever feel like you want to explore cartoons, <laughs> this is where I would encourage you to start. Okay. Other than that, yeah, maybe they're just not for you. So um, what is it about crocodilians, then, that trips your trigger? I mean, I think kind of like what I was saying a second ago, I mean, they're modern day dinosaurs. Like some of our crocodilian species have been around unchanged evolutionarily for, you know, hundreds of millions of years, uh, you know, some for probably over 200 million years. And just to think, you know, hey, this animal's been around. They haven't had to change. They've been, they've been successful. They've survived mass extinctions. And I mean, to me, they're just beautiful. Like just aesthetically, I think they're just such fascinating, gnarly, incredible looking animals and their adaptations and their ability to ambush predate and everything their bite force like they just they're just so beautiful to me i just find them so cool so i went to tulum mexico for a couple of weeks have you ever been down there no i've not no. i mean uh i've been nearby but i never got to tulum that's totally on my list yeah um it's super great place it's really good for yoga and spirituality and a beach and it's super quaint it's a quaint little town it's becoming a little bit more popular in general yeah. but also for a little bit more partying which is not why i go but however i stayed at this property that um was on the jungle side because it's basically one little street and there's beach side and there's jungle side oh, we stayed awesome. on the jungle side and they have um they have a like a they sort of pay homage to this resident sort of they say crocodile who is um, protects the there's three cenotes on the property, which are these sort of basically like sinkholes and they're like sacred, sacred in that area. And right. so in so it's in charge of protecting this cenote. Um, but then somebody else said they're like, don't jump in the big cenote because that's where the crocodile lives. And then somebody was like, no, nah, there's, there's not really a crocodile. It's kind of like a hybrid of this and that. And it's not, it, it's not, it doesn't want humans. It doesn't bite. And so then, but I'm going to go by the fact that we shouldn't go in because somebody said there's a crocodile. Now, do you know about that area? And is there some kind of breed of crocodilian that doesn't want to feed on a human? And what would make them want to feed on a human? Okay. So to answer your questions, yeah. Number one, there is the American crocodile native to that part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that is a species of crocodile that gets really big. I mean, they can get up to, I mean, it's rare to find an 18 foot, you know, uh, sized animal, but that's totally possible. They often get 12, 14 something feet. They get huge. Any crocodile species, whether it's a saltwater crocodile, American crocodile, um, a Nile crocodile, any of these big monster crocodiles, when they get to a certain size, anything that is of size that could be food could be food they don't look at people and be like like sharks for example big sharks that could technically totally chow down on a person people do get bit by sharks rarely but it does happen but sharks pretty much never actually consume people because right. they're just a few bold sharks that are you know they want to test bite something they realize hey this is really right what's that they get confused yeah i mean i don't if they're not confused well they're they're curious and they're bold. Okay. And they, they think, I'm going to try this. This might be good. It kind of resembles something I might eat. And then they take a bite. They're like, ah, oh, no, this doesn't taste good. I don't want it. Crocodiles, no. I mean, listen, I love crocodiles. I don't want to, you know, put any fear into people regarding crocodiles. But when it comes to a big crocodile, yeah, I mean, that's one of the few animals in the wild that could totally look at a person. And if they're of the right size, meaning like, you know, 11, 12 plus feet, probably, you know, maybe bigger, depending on how big the person is dude, you could be food and they, they will consume you and eat you and make a meal out of you. So in that area where there are huge American crocodiles, potentially, yeah, I wouldn't swim in water where there could be big, wild, um, potentially man-eating uh, American crocodiles. Well, all the cenotes are connected underground. 
all of them. Oh, so they kind of like go between back. Yeah, I mean, you're you're you might be playing with fire. I mean, it sometimes when you go to certain areas, if they're smaller water bodies, only smaller crocodiles or individuals live there. Okay, and if you go, if you come across a seven foot American crocodile, they're going to be way more scared of you than you are of them. They're not going to try to attack. They're not going to. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you're just not on the menu. You're too big. You know, they, they wouldn't think of it. I'm only um, five foot though. Oh. I look probably more delicious for someone because I'm little. Okay, so I'm six two. So maybe like a nine or ten foot American crocodile might look at you differently than they look at me. So <laughs> I, whatever I say, like in reference to me, just think of a little bit smaller crocodile that might eat you. And then of course, there's so many crocodile species that don't look, I mean, they just don't get a size where they'd ever consider people food. Mm. So like the Australian freshwater crocodile, I mean, they max out at maybe like seven or eight feet, maybe a little bit more, but that's probably pushing it. Um, you have the more let's crocodile, which is not far from uh, Tulum and that part of like, uh, you know, Southern North America and mm. Central America. And those guys maybe get, I don't know, maybe seven or eight feet as well. You have caiman species that only get to three to five feet. You have other crocodiles, even in like the Chinese alligator only gets to be like six or seven feet or something like that. So all these species would never look at even you at a, at a, at a mighty five foot would never even consider you a meal. So it just depends on the species. But if you're going to Africa and you come across a big Nile crocodile at a watering hole and you go and try to drink some water from it or swim in it or whatever, and there's a 14 foot Nile, you're toast, you know, so <laughs> it just depends. Where are the most dangerous um, crocodiles or crocodilian? I think really depends more on the size of uh, the, uh, the individual. Honestly, I mean, like, okay, alligator is the American alligator. What's the difference I, between a crocodile and an alligator? Uh, ge 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 geographic, like where oh. they're native to. Ge and then, That's of course, it? I mean, anatomically, no. I mean, one tip that I give, and it's a little bit confusing, but if you take the first letter of each of those words and then use that shape to resemble the snout of the opposite, then that's a way to kind of distinguish. So crocodiles have an A-shaped long snout. Oh, okay. so like an alligator. Alligators have a C-shaped snout, so you kind of have to flip it. Um, and then the alligator's teeth, when you look at their mouth when it's shut, the, te the upper jaw teeth of an alligator, when their mouth is shut, are the only ones you see. You don't really see many teeth from the lower jaw. You don't see any. And on an alligator, there's like the fourth tooth back on each side. So when they close, they've got these big like mm. lower teeth that kind of stick up that you can see. Kind of um, looks like my dog then. Yeah, if you got a little underbite dog, some of those underbite dogs look like little little crocodiles for sure. Well, that's a Belgian. I have a Belgian Malinois and and a, oh, um, I love those. And a miniature Siberian Husky, and so wow. they 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 they've got their sort of longer snouts and fangs. Those guys have fangs. Both those. Like guys. how I just drew an analogy be between my dogs and a crocodile. I mean, they're like the dog version of crocodiles. It's fair to say that. A Malinois might be with their bite. Malinois are pretty. I mean, I've worked with a lot of Malinois with my like in the conservation world. So a lot of parks use them in Africa. They're 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 pretty good anti poaching dogs. You know, they they've got really good drive, and they're very. I mean, they're that you can train them to be just little killing machines, and so they're they're pretty fast and they're they're pretty incredible. So that you know, and a lot of course a lot of the police force in the U.S. works with them too. I mean, all over the world. So more more often than not, when I'm working with Malinois. These are not your cuddly on the couch dogs. These are your working dogs and you don't want to be on the wrong side of that bite. Oh, Ella's cuddly on the couch. Ella is like yeah. the cuddliest on the couch. She wants to lay. She's If you're not touching her, she's trying to get you to touch her. She's, oh, sweet. she's, she's a lover. I feel like they're very, um, they have, they're like a master oriented. They have their person oh, yeah, yeah. and then they're, that's their person. It's hundred percent true. I mean, they, they want to please and they want to work. And they want, I mean, they want to do whatever it is that you want them to do mm. in a lot of ways, you know, they've been bred to just obey and, and make their, their, you know, whoever is their trainer, their owner, whoever to make them happy, you know? So what's the smartest dog or what's the smartest dogs? Like I'm thinking if somebody's listening and they want a dog, I want to go through like the smartest dogs, like the dumbest dogs, <laughs> the most friendly dogs, the meanest dogs. I mean, okay, so the smartest dogs, I mean, man, some of those Aussie Shepherds are just crazy smart. I mean, they're really like like mature toddlers. They're almost like kindergartners. You know, I mean, the amount they can learn and how quickly they learn and what they can do, they're capable of a lot. I mean, most breeds are really smart and have the potential to learn and do a lot of amazing things. 
Um, I, well, I have the potential for math, but I can't do that. So, you know. So. Right. I mean, as a human, but at the same time, right. <laughs> um, I mean, Henry, like my dog, I just showed you, he's a little chihuahua mix. He's a rescue little guy. And, you know, he's, um, he's kind of simple. Like he learns, I can teach him things. He can know what's good and bad. And, and, you know, he picks up on my, you know, what, what I want to see or not see pretty easily, but at the same time, you know, I wouldn't want to put him through any kind of rigorous training. Yeah, it's just not him. So I don't, I, I wouldn't say he's dumb, but you know, he's a simple guy and other breeds, you know, some of those little dogs can be a little bit simple, you know, some of them That's can a be nice way to put it. Fun. Yeah. They can be very, like a little, like some of the Pomeranians I've met they're, they're, they're a little bit on the simple side. Yeah. I mean, but you know, I've worked with Maltese's and Yorkies that are super smart, super mm -hmm. smart dogs. Okay. Well, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the nicest dogs then? I mean, I think any breed has the potential to be just absolute sweeters. I mean, pit bulls are one of the most underrated. Uh, they have such remarkable misconceptions. They can be the most loyal, sweet, just gentle dogs. They wouldn't hurt a fly. I've seen so many of them be so gentle with little baby kittens and baby birds mm. and baby humans in ways that are, I mean, they, they know they need to be gentle. They, I mean, when you think about their, the ability they have in terms of their strength, their power, their bite force, just their overall weight and size. And they can just be so gentle to such delicate little creatures. So I think really any breed has, you know, a lot of potential for that. And that's just one breed that I think a lot of people assume to be little killing machines when really they're such good, such good loyal dogs. So then I suppose similarly on the other side, you'd say then that if I was going to ask what the, what the uh, meanest side is, is meanest animal, it would be the same. Like any dog can be mean. Like I have a, my dog Dallas is like the miniature Siberian. She's just really protective of her space. Yeah. I say that if she was some dad's daughter, it would be like the dream daughter because she's very protective of her space and she doesn't let anyone touch her. Right. And I'd be like, that would be that. like every dad's dream daughter. <laughs> totally. I love that's hilarious. You yeah, have to spend a lot of time earning her trust. Right. Exactly. That's perfect. That would keep a lot of dads less stressed, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some breeds are a little bit more of a handful than us. I mean, so I'm a veterinarian. I work, I work with a lot of wildlife, of course, but I also work in a veterinary hospital and I work with mm -hmm. a lot of exotics and wildlife, but a ton of dogs and cats. Um, there are some dog breeds that I know when I just see the breed before I even meet the patient, then statistically there is a higher chance this, this dog might be a bigger pain in the butt than some of the other uh, breeds that I work with. So some of those um, Sharpays can be a handful. And I'm saying, what I'm saying, I'm, pretty sure all my veterinary colleagues would agree and all the vet techs and people in the vet, you know, industry out there would understand this. Uh, Sharpays, Dalmatians can be a handful. Chows can be a handful. Mm. Um, Weimariners. Uh, some, some of the German shepherds and, and Malinois and Dutch shepherds, you know, especially like when I've worked with police force ones, mm. they have such high drive and prey drive and they, they're, they're trained and they always want to work. And so when they come in the hospital and they have to sit and run for a few minutes, they start losing their mind. So they can be a bit of a handful mm. too. So those are some breeds I might anticipate potentially having a more difficult patient. But at the same time, I've had any one of those breeds be total sweethearts. And then I've had the classic sweetheart breeds. I mean, one of, I'd say one of the meanest, just one of the meanest dogs I've ever worked with was a golden retriever. I mean, that's the American, you know, sweetheart, right? I mean, that's one of the right. best, sweetest dogs, but I'm telling what you. What happened? What was the story? Breed, there was no apparent known. I mean, the owner's were great owners. They were super sweet people. I knew them and saw this patient for many years. They had kids. I mean, this dog, there was no apparent reason as to why this dog behaved the way it did. Um, and it, they got it at a young age mm -hmm. and they gave it a great life. And it, there was no known traumatic experiences. Like, I don't know. I, I, I think it was just the way that dog was wired. I mean, just like people, you know, some people are just kind of special and he was kind of special, you know. Do you uh, believe in reincarnation? I'm open to it. You know, I, I am, I don't, I don't know, but I, I, you know, who knows what happens to our souls and where they go. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Do you Wondering if that soul was an asshole and it needs to learn its lesson? <laughs> yeah. But why would you go be a, like a dog's life and like a really nice loving family in a, in a, in a, in, you know, a first world country. Like he should have went and been like, you know, some animal that like, I don't know, there's a lot of sad stories for animals, but. I would have put a jerk somewhere else. So I don't know. I mean, you could be right though. Maybe he was just kind of a dick and it's like, you need to be humbled a little bit. You need to be a dog. And then he was just kind of grouchy about it or his soul was. 
I a hundred percent feel like I was a dog in another life, or I perhaps there's a timeline existing right now where I'm a dog because my resonance for like their pain and suffering and love. Like when I go to other countries like Peru or Mexico or, you know, somewhere places in the world where they're just everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I want to take them all home. And do you, do you have that level? Do you feel that for any animals in specific or feel that uh, at all? Or, or what, like, what's the emotional level that called you to animals? I mean, it's a lot of what you're saying. I mean, you just, it's, it's empathy. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? It's just mm -hmm. like putting yourself in this animal's shoes and knowing every day is a struggle. They don't know if they're going to eat. They probably have a multitude of different tropical diseases. You know, when we're talking about these dogs we see in Mexico or Peru or, mm -hmm. or you know, Southeast Asia or what, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it all too. And it's, a, mm -hmm. they're heartbreakers, you know, and um, you really, you, you also see that these, a lot of these are just sweet animals and they're misunderstood and they're in places where people don't get their needs met. And yeah. any time you go to a country where the people don't get their needs met, the animals aren't the first priority and they're really not going to get their needs met. So that can be a really sad story. And, that's, um, I mean, that, that in my experience and what I've seen, that, that seems to be probably the biggest correlative factor as to why I see an excess of animals that are just, you know, street animals and this and that. There's, miss, you know, lack of education and then people uh, have their own struggles. But do you have like some kind of, was there some sort of moment or some story, something that happened that was really like emotional for you that catapulted you into the work that you do especially doing because you travel a lot like getting out of you know getting out into other countries and into the wildlife realm which is i mean so far beyond just being a veterinarian and you know locally mm -hmm. um honestly i've always known animals to be a big part of my life whether it was just personally or if it was personally and professionally I didn't honestly know I wanted to be a vet until I was in early in college and I was taking some intro to bio courses and I took an evolutionary biology course and I, it, that was the first time in my life I actually liked to learn. I liked to study. I liked to mm -hmm. kind of delve into those subjects and got really excited about it and I had really good teachers that were passionate about it and that was a huge part of that too. Um, you know, I was, always had appreciation for medicine, but there was a few things that kind of played into that, but that's when I knew I wanted to be a vet. But I mean, my, I had pets growing up. My, my parents always said I was really gentle with animals. I wasn't one of those kids that was too rough with them or pulling on them or pulling their ears or their tails. Like I was always just really sweet with them. And I've always had a big soft spot for animals. I mean, it's, I think, again, it comes down to uh, like a, a, it's, it's an empathy, you know, I mean, they can't speak for themselves and I'm, I'm lucky that I, I have a natural ability to kind of read animals. I mean, animals, I say they don't speak because they don't speak English, but animals do communicate. And you can learn a lot from their, from their facial Same expressions, that. their mannerisms, their wags, uh, you know, everything they're doing. I can learn so much from an animal just within a few seconds of, of beginning to engage with one. Um, and I always, you know, I always loved that. And I, you know, I had pets all through my life growing up. My first dog was actually a shepherd uh, Doberman mix named Bruno. And um, I mean, that was one of those dogs that was super loyal and was obsessed with me. And I was obsessed with him. And we had this really tight bond. And I've had that with animals my whole life since then, you know, and um, I can't, I can't like pin it on one thing. Like this was like my aha. Oh my God. I'm like, I love animals so deeply. It's just been, it's kind of been all along the way, like along my entire journey, they've been such a significant part of my life on a personal and professional level. Mm -hmm. What, um, what are the biggest differences between like animals and people? Cause I know there's similarities and I want to talk about that too, but what are the differences? Like do animals actually need us? Uh, yeah. Henry needs me like for real. He's, he's extreme. We have a, a, a legitimate codependent relationship. So domesticated animals. Yes, yeah. I, I love that. You know, I, I said, uh, I've said before, I'm like, look, I know I need to heal a little codependency in my life, but can I just shift that codependency to Ella? Like if I could just be codependent with Ella <laughs> a little bit, I feel like I could solve it for the rest of people. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, and then, to, well, what, what, so you were saying what's, what's different. So a couple of yeah. things. One, animals never lie. They're always honest. And that goes into being able, to, being able to communicate with them. If I go into the exam room and I see an animal is, uh, you know, hiding behind their owner and their their tails tucked between their legs and their ears are back and that you know they're they're telling me they're they're communicating very clearly i'm shy i'm nervous i don't know you and i'm a little bit scared whereas if i go into a room 
they're tail wagging, they're running to jump on me, they're panting and smiling and just being ridiculous. Like they're telling me, hey, let's be best friends. I can't wait to play with you. So that's that's one thing. Another thing is, um, and I love this about our pets, you know, like even just dogs, for example, but this goes for a lot of animals, but they live in the moment. They're not regretting the past. They're not stressed about the future. They're not thinking about anything other than right here, right now. And they're enjoying that and making the most of that. And so when I come home, if I've been out all day and I see my dog, Henry, He's so happy to see me right now. He wants to enjoy this moment right now. And that goes for every moment of their day. You know, they just, that's, that's how they live. And I think, you know, I think there's, there's a, I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, I'm not, you know, it's nice to, you know, reflect on the past. It's nice to, you know, have your future in mind, but I think it's also nice to live in the moment. Is it true that animals like, um, that they have essentially short-term memory loss in a way that they or it's that they can't keep track of time. So one minute could be one hour, could be one day, could be like, is that a true thing with yeah, animals? I mean, the way they behave would, would obviously indicate that when you leave town for a week versus you leave your house for 20 minutes, your dog is equally excited to see you right. on that occasion. Right. So um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I think they do have more of a concept of time than what they're given credit for. Mm -hmm. um, but also you can't totally communicate to your animal, hey, I'm just leaving for like 20 minutes, dude. Like, just chill. Everything's going to be fine. I'll be back soon. Um, Henry actually has learned. He knows when I'm leaving town. And I try to like mix up what I do, but he, he sees my routines. He sees me packing. He sees the suitcases. He sees the backpacks. So he knows what's going on. And every time I start packing like clothes on my bed, like laying out what I'm bringing or whatever, he goes and sits on them and pouts and looks really sad. And I'm like, shit, you know what's going on? Like, you know, I'm going to leave today or tomorrow or something. Yeah. Um, Who watches your dog? Uh, I mean, I have pet sitters. Like, I mean, I've, yeah, I've always worked that out. Does it make you feel bad? Does you feel like, do you, are, or do you have like rules for the people watching your dog? I mean, I have, I mean, like I cook my dog's food for them and there's a lot of things that they need to know about my dogs. So if someone's going to watch them. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky my pet sitters, they ask all those questions. If I don't tell them, they're asking me to tell them. Like, so they're, they're, uh, they're awesome. And they do everything I ask. They do all the little weird, silly things that might not even make sense. And they're happy to do it. And they just, I mean, they send me pictures of my pets every time they sit and cuddle with them and they, uh, they're awesome. So yeah, that all works out luckily. I mean, I do feel bad. Like, I mean, other than, you know, last year I was home a lot, you know, a lot of borders were closed and it was a unique year. But the last few years prior to that, I mean, I'd be gone for like a third of the year. I was out of the country, you know, so it's. Do you, it's, um, do you ever get sick of just talking about animals? No, I don't think so. You don't? I mean, no, I love it. Honestly, like, I mean, listen, I've had weeks where it's been a long, intense week at the vet hospital and I just want to get home and I just want to like get away, you know, get it, get out of there. But like, I can talk animals all the time. I mean, that's really, that's all I'm good for. Like, if you want to start talking about other stuff, you, you, I'm not going to be very interesting anymore. So. <laughs> well, so you only talk about animals. If you were to have a dinner party, like what would be the funnest conversation to have at the dinner table? And you can't say it. You could say animals if you want, if you want, if you want to, you can say I mean, that. I feel like um, it depends on who I'm there with. Like if I'm having, like, I've got my mom and little brother in town and it's a little family dinner, you know, we'll talk about pretty tame stuff and it's fun and funny. If I've got some of my best friends over, you know, you, I probably shouldn't say what would be the funnest thing to talk about. What? You know, at the dinner table. Come on. <laughs> uh my friends are total perverts so you know we you don't <laughs> no i'm just kidding um yeah no i, I don't like literally don't lie. you should see the text mind. dialogue i've been having today on some of my group chats oh, <laughs> there you go. messages i'm sure i know what that's about yeah you get it i mean you know it just depends on who you're talking to i don't literally talk animals constantly i mean usually when i do podcasts or something like that i'm probably going to be talking about animals but i'm happy to right. i mean i love it honestly i like I think there's so much to, to learn from animals. I think there's so much to teach from animals. I've, I've, I've gotten a lot of, I'm really lucky. I've had experiences working with animals all over the world. And I've gotten to work, you know, up close and personal with so many different species. And a lot of people's, you know, some of their favorite animals to work with, like elephants or rhino or crocodiles or venomous snakes or gorillas or chimps or what have you. And um, I love sharing those stories. I love educating people about that and what's important regarding their conservation and just unique interesting things about them i mean there's 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 so much to be said what are your other interests do you have any other hobbies 
I mean, like, obviously you keep very busy and you travel for animals, but there must be other things you like doing. Yeah, absolutely. So this, over this last year, I got super into woodworking. What? And my dad's a professional woodworker. Can I uh, see something like you made? Job. Is there anything there that you made? You want to see my first real furniture project? Yes. I'm so proud of and excited about these. So I, I, I literally just started this. We're going to go for a little a little walk here. So I did you create like a, here. do you have like a woodworking shop in, in yeah, like Yeah, we can show you the shop too if you want to see. I'd be happy to show you. <laughs> so these... I'm going to try to see if I can get you. Can you see that chair? Yeah. You made that? I made these. Yeah. That's this, uh, amazing. Raw walnut. And they're like a, they're called a Z chair. It's like a mid-century style. I don't know if you can see. I feel like you could sell yeah. that at, um, uh, what's that called? Uh, it's called Design Within Reach. I like to call it Design Just Out of Reach because it's actually very expensive. Um, but that looks like some sort of like uh, old sort of. 60s? They're mid-century. Yeah, they're totally mid-century. It's called a Z-chair. It's a total wow. mid-century style. I'm taking in the garage now. Sorry, it's just dark here for a sec. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. So just flipping on the lights here. Here's the shop. And so this was my first big purchase. It's a big uh, uh, table saw. That's a huge table saw. And I made, I did design and make this. It's a miter stand uh, for my miter saw. That's what that big like chop saw is, huh. That's workbench. Um, those are a bunch of jigs, and jigs are yeah. things you use on your tools to yeah. do certain kinds of cuts and whatnot. And yeah. then my recent, my most recent big power tool purchase was this beast. Yeah, That's a bandsaw, and it was uh, it was really nice to have making these chairs. But yeah, no, I'm totally nerd now. Like I love this hobby; it's been so much fun. That's amazing. You had a lot of time, so you made how, what is so quarantine you benefited from quarantine with two Z chairs. You built your woodworking shop up and what else did you do? Did you make any, did you make any like holiday gifts for people? No, I made, I mean, the first thing I ever made outside the shop was a, was a, a butcher, like a cutting board. Oh and yeah. I need a cutting crafting. block. Can I, can I am, can I hire you out for a cutting board? I yeah. need a really nice cutting board. I made, I, so I had some scrap maple and I made this, beast of a cutting board i'll show you i like i'm I just, really short so it can't be too thick because then i'm up on my tiptoes <laughs> this one i mean it's over an inch but it's not like crazy but it's it's not little oh amazing yeah it's i want a nice great. checkerboard one because of my racing history there you go okay i can do that i will i'll we pay do, top do, do dollar with a walnut and maple They'll walnut like maple and white checkers, like, right? like a really light, light white, you know, lighter maple and some Ooh. dark walnut. I love it. Look at, look at, see, look where we went. Now I have a cutting board <laughs> and everything and maybe some Z chairs at some point in time. Those are incredible. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really pumped on them. Yeah. Do you plan on, um, see, I love the idea that the things that we just enjoy doing become businesses. So that's kind of how my life has evolved, um, oh. especially post racing, just interests. Like I love wine. So I have two labels now and, you know, just various, I, I love talking to people and I have a podcast. So, you know, I take the things that I enjoy doing and I just, they somehow manifest into businesses. So do you, have you dreamt into the sort of like, um, into the full potentiality of this, um, passion project? Well, so with the, I mean, when I, okay, when I made this cutting board, I was thinking it would be really fun to, even if it's not like uh, becoming a part of my profession and like my income, even just doing it, like I was thinking like doing a cutting boards for conservation kind of thing, oh, where yeah. I make, you know, personalized mm -hmm. cutting boards and then, you know, I auction them off or something and raise the money for, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, the Rhino, uh, Rhino uh, anti-poaching organization I work with or with, you know, for chimpanzee conservation I've worked with or elephants or what have you, just something, you know, something I can use my, that craft to then raise some money and try to get, you know, Love that. use that for something. Um, you just name the price for that cutting board. And I know that it's going to go to helping animals, which is, I mean, you're tugging at, I mean, that's why those ASPCA commercials and all that, like gosh, yeah. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin singing and you're like, I can't keep it together. Um, I mean, cause people want to help. They do. Yeah, no, they do. No, it's funny. So with the racing, I, I didn't, I should have thought of that. So that's something else. And I've taken it. No, I don't race. I've not raced. Um, but I like, I was never a huge car person. 
Mm-hmm. And then a couple of years ago, I got really excited about cars and like, I love muscle cars and I got a challenger and did some modifications to it. And it, it is <laughs> so damn fun. And I, I never had a stick before. I always had automatic cars. I'm like, dude, yeah. it, it looks so fun. And now I can't imagine yeah. having a stick, like going automatic. And I'm yeah. manual is so much fun. It's so damn fun. It's yeah. like when you can rev match and every like, oh my God, it's just, Oh, I could teach you how to like blip downshift. I could teach you how to, I could teach you how to do all that stuff. I can teach you how to apex corners. Can we please going canyon roads? Let's go. Okay, so let's go snake hunting in Arizona. We haven't gotten to that yet, but that's so so good there. Like some of my favorite rattlesnakes in the world are native to not far from where you are. Okay. Um, Let's get in the workshop. Okay. And then let's please go racing. I love that. Um, I mean, how long is this project? Is this hobby? Is that literally those chair and that creation just a year old, like meaning as a hobby or did you? Oh, no. Yeah, no, I literally. So you saw, did you see the webbing on the chairs like that? Upholstered yeah. webbing. So there's going to go, there's going to be cushions on the back and then on the seat bottom. So there's, okay. I'm waiting for cushions that I'm having made right now. I literally officially finished those chairs the day before yesterday. I finished the webbing. I mean, this I've I, I've been working on them for the last couple of months, and literally just totally finished the finish. I I used a, I did a polyurethane finish after doing a shellac and a stain, and you know everything. No, that that's like the most recent, super recent thing that just came out. I didn't get my I got my table saw in April, and so I I everything just kind of started from there. So like I built and designed my workbench that miter stand with all the drawers that maybe you saw with it with the mm-hmm. with the chop saw on it. I built and designed that. That took a lot of time. So everything else has been shop furniture. And these are my real, like, these are my projects of what I can do outside the shop, what I can actually create with the shop. So yeah, it's all very, very new. Isn't it so fun how, you know, we can take something that we love doing, maybe even just that we're good at. Like if I'm going to, this is a confession. Um, I've said it before, so it's not like it's brand new, but but it's, it's just that, you know, racing was what I did, but honestly, like it wasn't a passion in a way that I loved racing. I loved aspects of racing, but it, I don't go watching it. I don't go doing it. I don't do it for fun. Like I do other things for fun. And so mm-hmm. when I say that it wasn't, you know, like I didn't love it, it's that I didn't love racing itself. And so it's interesting how sometimes, and I don't, I'm not saying this is for you, but obviously this is something that you're really good at, obviously, and, and really Thank interested you. in and get very excited about and how we can, sometimes our life can start one way and just sort of turn left and, or right, or turn around and, 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 and take us to these different places where um, we learn something else that we truly love, but it's through the original platform that gives us the ability to do that other thing in a really big way. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's so true and how we evolve and end up doing things. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, like this woodworking, it all started because I wanted to build a new reptile enclosure. Uh, really? for, one my, for my pet snake and like my dad who he does he's a professional woodworker and that's more of what he does on the side his main income is through other means and he's a stock market kind of guy but he just he just loves working with wood he's very passionate about it and he's like son you got to get a table saw and I barely knew what that was <laughs> and then I started investigating exploring and I it just it sucked me in at wow. first and like it applies you know I mean it's working with your hands which I do like and there is some crossover and I do think being in the veterinary field, you do have, uh, you know, you do work towards and have a skill set for that. Just, you know, being a surgeon and I do surgery and I, you know, I'm a surgeon too, just with, uh, with animals, obviously. And, um, I think that plays into it. And then just my strengths are in the maths and sciences. So like when it comes to kind of making that stuff happen, but at the same time, if I went back in time, even just a couple of years ago and said, Hey, you're going to make a couple chairs, yeah. chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be so stoked about them. I would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> right. I'm not a big, you know, furniture is cool, but like, I'm not going to be excited about chairs. And yeah, it is funny where that takes you, you know, <laughs> it, it kind of makes me think about change and how, you know, change is a scary thing. Um, and I, I think it's not actually even that, um, you know, like for me, the changes in my life too. uh, it's not that I'm so scared of where I'm going. It's that you, it's sort of a death of the old. 
And again, I'm not saying like, this is obviously a new hobby and I'm just sort of, I'm really extrapolating this idea out into other spaces that might be relatable for other people that have things going on. But, but, you know, you know, this could lead to your life being so different someday and, you know, uh, or just even showing people how quickly you can, you know, uh, learn more about yourself through following these hobbies. Like, have you learned any, have you learned any lessons? Like, is there any sort of things that you can pull from this experience and that you're like, wow, I, that's actually a lesson right there. Yeah. Um, gosh. Uh, I mean, it's kind of reinforced some lessons in a, in a very palpable way, like where, you know, you know, one of the big ones actually is go with your gut. And that's mm -hmm. such a lesson that everybody's probably heard mm -hmm. and it's probably had something they can reflect on where they did or didn't and, and are happy they did or wish they did if they didn't. Uh, but there's times where, you know, I, I'm, if I have a dimension, for example, and I think, man, this might not be quite right. I think I can make it work, but I, I don't know, you know, and it might not be right. And then you keep going and then way further down the project, you realize, shoot, you know, I should have changed that when I had the chance, when it would have been much easier. And so just it reinforces stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, patience is another big one. And that's a virtue when it comes to this hobby. Like there are times when I, especially with these chairs, it was my first time making a project. So it's going to take me longer than it would if I'd been doing it for years, yeah. obviously. But man, that test to me and just seeing something through completion is something I always want to do. But this like really was a test. It was just I, it, it, the last couple of weeks, I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to finish these. Somebody just stay in these, just get this done. Like I need to move on to the next thing because it's like been taking too much of my life right now. <laughs> the joy is in the journey. Yeah, it is. And it is. Uh, I mean, it really up until that point, it really was like, it's so fun because it's kind of meditative when you get in the shop. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you have, usually you have ear protection in because especially if you're working with any of the power tools, they're loud, you have your dust extraction, like it's, it's kind of abusive on your ears. And so I have earplugs uh, and sometimes my, like, like I go to a shooting range and stuff. So I've got like my, my muffs on top and, um, it went, you kind of helps you get in your own head. It's like a, it's like a partial sensory deprivation kind of mm, thing. It's like and a moving you, meditation. Yeah, it is. And like you're focused on that moment and then your head can get away from you and you just let it run wild and think about all the thoughts that might be going mm -hmm. on. And you just kind of escape from reality and just get into your zone and just enjoy it. And I, I it is the joy is in the journey in that way in a very big way. Yeah. You said, trust your gut. Is there, um, are there things going on right now where you're like, Oh my God, I know I need to trust my gut on this one, but right now I'm like battling this. Like, I'm like, I need to do this or I need to do that. Or I think this, are there other things that you're, that now that you've kind of been sort of reinforced with that lesson of trust your gut that you're like, ah, oh, damn it. But I wasn't ready for that one. I don't know. Um, outside of the shop and those, I mean, yeah, nothing that comes to mind. That's such an awesome question. No, I can't think of it. I can't think of how that can apply to something outside of that at the moment, which is kind mm. of, it, but yeah. What about you? Mm. Um, for me on things that I kind of know, it's like, I mean, just things that I need to move on from emotionally, mentally, um, uh, trusting and knowing, like really feeling like, yeah, this is what I should be doing right now with the travel that I love and exploring and sort of like being a bit of a nomad gypsy for a while and just like really like seeing the world. Um, like I haven't been single for 16 years. So I'm like, I love traveling. And so I'm trusting sort of that and trusting the flow. I think sometimes too, it's a matter of surrendering. It's knowing what you want, but then surrendering to the way that it ends up going and thinking like, well, if this goes away, then it's meant something else is meant to come in. And if, and if that, uh, and if this doesn't work out, something else will better be better. Or if this is meant to be, it'll be easy and it'll just keep flowing. And so, yeah, I think that sort of that knowing that that in that sort of thought is a matter of like learning how to flow too. 
Um, cause it's, it's uh, you have to get out of the way of the mind. The mind has to yeah. get out of the way to allow that stuff that you kind of know to trust the gut, right? Otherwise you're yeah. back in your mind again, and you're just trying to use your, you can only pull from what you know when you're using the mind, but when you start using the body and the intuition and the knowing that is beyond the rational mind, then it takes you to places that you haven't been before. I think you said that beautifully. It's so true. And it's so hard for me to do that too. It's like, I'm such a rational evidence, or I, I go off evidence-based information. I go off what makes the most sense. That's where I find myself leaning towards, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, what, whatever it is. And it's like, if you can back it up with, with evidence, you know, then great. And so I, it's, it's that it becomes hard for me to go off intuition and gut sometimes because I want to think about, well, why does this make sense? Why would it be? And it's, so it's, it's a fine line and sometimes it becomes challenging, but I think you're totally right. And, but when I'll tell you this, I, I don't think I've ever made a, so anytime I've made a decision based on my intuition and gone off my gut, I don't think I've ever regretted it. Yeah. Because even if I was wrong in that decision or it seemed wrong and then maybe something else came out of it, then it ended up being right. But even if it doesn't seem right, it's like, dude, you can't feel bad about going with your gut. Like you, you, you can't, you know, you just, you can't predict the future. And if it doesn't turn out the way you thought or hoped it might, you know, you can't feel bad about that. And so there's something to be said and just kind of letting go and not overthinking it and just letting so it hard. Take over. But it is, it's, it's harder. It's easier said than done. It really is. I think it's a bit, and it's the, you know, for, for everyone we get in our head, but I think for men in general, I think it can be a little bit harder mm -hmm. um, on top of it, just because of ego and sort of the patriarchal, like yeah. sort of dine, you know, dynamic we've lived in for so long. I, um, I think it can be a little harder for men. So I, my heart goes out. Oh, well, thank you. I'm That's not judging at all. Better your sympathy yeah no no i don't i don't I, I mean you're probably right yeah that probably plays into it i wouldn't be surprised at all i mean there's a lot of preconceived cultural um and uh and just man versus women around the world i mean they're not versed but you know as compared to women yeah i mean that's probably true i wouldn't i be think surprised. that if i'm get if i'm feeling right I, I would imagine though that you you do use that sort of feeling and intuition with your job because oh. animals can't speak to you literally. So, you know, you're having to use that aspect of yourself every day that you're, that you're working or shoot every day with your dog, you know, you, you're using those intuitive emotional skills to, to, uh, to do your work. In a very real way. I mean, some of my favorite vets, they'll remind you that, you know, medicine is an art it's not just a science, it's also an art. So there's no black and white, there's no one way to do things. And sometimes you have a patient where um, what would seem like the ideal thing to do uh, is actually going to end up being detrimental. Uh, for example, if I'm working with, a, say, a high stress uh, prey animal species, like even just say a guinea pig, you know, and like, okay, it, it, in one way, this guinea pig would really benefit from me hospitalizing him getting IV fluids right. and doing all this intensive treatment then I, then I know medically is in his best interest. And then the other side of me is if I have this animal here, he's going to be stressed out. He's not going to eat. That's going to throw off all his gut flora. The stress is going to affect his immune system and everything's going to get messed up because of that. Even though I'm trying to do what's what I, what would make the most sense or what should be the right thing. So you have to, you are constantly having to evaluate what's best for that patient and go off your gut and do things that might not seem like it's the best idea on paper, are based on the, the research, but for that patient, it's really the most appropriate thing to do. So every, every case can have some element of that. Some are more straightforward than, than others. Not everyone is this like battle, but like there are some complicated cases where, you know, it's every time you get this kind of thing, it's not going to be the same. You know, it's always a different story mm. uh, from one patient to the next. And there's so many, there's so many variables and factors and owner compliance and all that kind of stuff that plays into it. Uh, you know, how you're, how you're going to decide to do what's best or what you feel is best for this patient. I'm curious. Um, Cause I feel bad in this scenario for the animals, but what do you think about zoos? I, okay. So zoo, the word zoo is such a big, broad word. Okay. That means so many things. So when we're talking about good quality zoos, 
then our AZAs uh, accredited, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which mm -hmm. have strict guidelines for how these animals are cared for, how these zoos uh, give back to conservation, their veterinary care, their, you know, their enrichment, like all the things that, that are important for these animals and their wildlife counterparts. You know, not just the tiger they have here, but also what are we doing for tigers in Sumatra? What are we doing for, you know, gorillas in uh, the Congo? You know, um, those zoos are so incredibly important for our mm -hmm. wildlife and so incredibly important overall. Mm. So good zoos like the LA Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, the Henry Dorley Zoo uh, are so, so good for animals and wildlife. I mean, listen, there are some individuals in zoos that might be not living their best life. And it's, it's a heartbreaker and it's a bummer. And I'm not happy to see that by any means. But you have to realize some of these animals, they're kind of an ambassador for their species. They're kind of taking one for the team because they are there to help give, um, you know, an experience to a child or, or, or an adult to get eye contact with these animals, see what they're like and see, you know, just, just have an appreciation for them at the, at the very basic level. Mm -hmm. Okay. I and mean, that's how we can connect most people with wildlife. Most people aren't lucky like you or I, where we get to go to Peru and Mexico and all over the world and see animals and wildlife all over the place. That's we're one of the, we're an exception. And so I've gotten to see all my favorite animals and there are a lot of my favorite animals in their native habitat, but most people don't. If they're ever really going to lay their eyes on a gorilla, that's the only realistic way that they're going to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but most of these good zoos, they're, they're giving these animals good lives. I'm not saying every animal in the zoo, yeah. it just sucks to be them and they're not happy. Like nature is a bitch. I mean, nature is not fun. It's not easy. And it's scary as hell. It's not butterflies and rainbows. It's yeah. every day, find food or be eaten find shelter, deal with the elements, deal with tropical diseases, deal with infectious diseases and parasites, deal with the, all the, everything. And it's like every day is a struggle. Every day is scary. Every day you might die. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these animals that are in good quality zoos, they're in a nice habitat with good enrichment. Uh, they're social. They have other members of the same species. They have phenomenal vet care. They have phenomenal diet. They get all their needs met. Like yeah. they're living a good life. I'm not saying I want to take all the wild animals and put them in captivity, yeah. but like, it's not like it's so bad. The wild is not like just, it's not butterflies and rainbows. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just not. So um, that's, I mean, that's in a basic way, that's why it's important. And then if you really understand what zoos do for conservation, I mean, I've worked with so many different zoo projects where they're going, I mean, one, one I did not long ago was go to Uganda and we're doing a giraffe translocation. We're taking giraffe from a big national park and putting them into another part of the country where they've been locally extinct there for 40 years mm -hmm. because they got poached out for bushmeat by this um, militant, the Lord's Resistance Army, which was like a super militant uh, guerrilla army that just went and raped and pillaged and killed people all over the country that didn't agree with their values. Um, and so when we were doing that, we had people from the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado, and they're getting skin samples, DNA samples, uh, they're getting ectoparasites on these animals, and they're doing a lot of things to learn more about these animals, compare them to what we know in captivity, and learn how to better treat both parties and make you know, both, both parties more healthy. And then of course, they're a part of that project. They're contributing to this happening, which was super important from a conservation perspective with the Draft Conservation Foundation. I mean, yeah. that zoos are behind a lot of this work and the big zoos, the good zoos, they do tremendous amounts uh, towards in, in the way of hands-on and direct and even money-wise contributing mm. to the kind of conservation of our wildlife so, around the world. What do you look up to know if your zoo is, what is the certification? AZA, and that's okay. that's to answer your question. Yeah, if their association of zoo and aquariums uh, accredited or certified, yeah, um, then it's it's a good zoo. You know, you can pretty much just yeah, black and white say that. And th there are some other good zoos that maybe don't have that uh, accreditation yet. But, but it's a um, bulletproof way to know that there's some guidelines. Yeah, exactly. And all those big zoos have that. But then that, I said zoo is such a big word because there's so many shitty little roadside. BS places trying to make some money that have nothing to do with conservation. Well, what did you think about Tiger King then? Oh, that's a whole other. I mean, how did you, I'm sure you've talked about this a million times. I hate asking questions that I feel like you've probably been asked, but. Oh, I mean, that was, that was, that was, I'm glad it gave people insight onto the, into the world of cub petting and what it means to be tigers in captivity, because that was horrible. None of those places are doing it right. None of those places are doing any real work towards conservation. I was trying to see what the difference was between each of them and how they like, like, oh, Carol Baskin, like, I'm pretty sure she was doing the same thing as what's the other guy's name? Joe? Was it what was his name? Yeah, Joe Exotic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they kind of look like the same. 
totally sketchy and yeah. weird. And she was in it for different reasons to begin with and then turned herself into some kind of sanctuary. So, I mean, whatever. And then you have that other guy doing the cub petting and, uh, yeah. And then, you know, and then, uh, and then, I mean, there, there, there are a bunch of freaks and here's the thing with the, with the cub petting world. Okay. Uh, you're only legally allowed to use these tigers to, to, for cub petting from like, I think it's like eight to 16 or 12 to 16 weeks of age. It's like this really short window of a life that can be into yeah. the early twenties, Oh God. you know, yeah. well through the teens. And so you got a window of a month or two. Um, they don't have the means, the finances, the space to care for every animal they breed. And so they have these litters, they sell these animals and they use this money to, as a, in a, like a business they're not using it for conservation or anything. They just sell these cubs to other crappy zoos that live in small chain link enclosures in Oklahoma yeah. or whatever. Uh, sometimes they sell them internationally and they go to places like Thailand and they go to some other even sketchier tiger exhibit because their laws are not like ours. Mm -hmm. And many of those animals are euthanized for the illegal black markets where people want to get tiger bones and tiger bladder and tiger teeth and tiger skin and all this crap uh, for a profit. I mean, it's a really ugly industry. It's not doing anything for the conservation of our wild tigers right. and most of the tigers in those captive situations are not living their best life and it's just it just fuels this ugly industry of something that should not be the, the you know the, the, that really shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way that shouldn't be how we appreciate tigers like yes i you know i'd love for you know people to get the interactions and i've been so you know blessed to have with a lot of wildlife around the world but petting tiger cubs in that setting and in that way and with how that business model works is not the right way to do it and every time you support it you know, you're not doing any favors for those individuals and you're definitely not doing anything for tiger conservation in a real way. Yeah. Where can people go in your experience um, for those really authentic experiences if someone's able to have the means to travel um, to, to see the most amount of wildlife? Yeah, I mean, wildlife rescues are a really cool way to get it close and personal with wildlife. And these are places that uh, rescue and rehabilitate and ideally release uh, wildlife uh, that's native to wherever they are. And so mm -hmm. I've been to, uh, you know, I, I was in one in Peru. I've been to one, you know, all over South America. I've been to ones in Central America, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia. And these are places where they take in their, uh, their native wildlife. And then if they're injured or orphaned, they try to rehabilitate them and get them back in the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, volunteering in a place like that, you can get great hands-on experience. And there's other places that are more established, like the classic is like the Elephant Nature Park in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And this is a place that takes in elephants that, you know, have gone through hell and back to be used in the illegal logging or the tourism industry. And they get to, they live on this big open space and you can volunteer even for a day to go, you know, feed them and spend some time with them and just help out a little bit. You get these interactions with them. Um, some species, it's hard to get up close and personal with like tigers. Like, I mean, I can't think of a place where it's really a great thing to go pet a tiger unless you have some connection with the zoo and they have some cubs that are going to be staying in captivity and it's like an okay thing. But with that, with some of those species, it's a little bit tougher to try to pull that off. I love seeing the animals. So for me, I, 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 I think I, yeah, I mean, I've been, I've seen some animals in different places, maybe, um, a few, few different countries I've been in and that seem like they have kind of sanctuaries like that. And maybe there's like a cheetah or something like that. And mm -hmm. I'm obsessed. I, I literally think maybe this should be some parting words. I feel like I could pet a bobcat outside. If a bobcat walked by, I'd be like, look, bobcat energetically. I think we could be friends. Is that a bad idea? I admire your, that you would like to do that and that you think you could do that. And it's pretty adorable. And I think that's great. Um, listen, I, okay, so in a, in a, for being serious, like, no, I don't encourage people to interact with wildlife. And it's in the best interest of you and the wildlife. Number one, if you're in a situation where you can get within arm's reach of a bobcat, I'd be worried about you. Okay, so it probably means that animal's quarter and it can't get away. Because anytime you approach a wild bobcat that really is wild, it's going to want to get away from you. So if you get that close... Yeah you're putting yourself in a dangerous position. I'm not saying a bobcat's yeah. going to bite your neck and bleed you out and kill you, but they can scratch you up. They can, they can rough you up pretty good. I mean, they're, they're a pretty capable and gnarly little wildcat. Um, but you know, you know, when you, when you do that and engage with wildlife like that, you affect their trust towards people and most people they can't trust. Mm -hmm. um, and then it makes them also a little bit more dangerous because then they think, Oh, people are cool. 
I'm going to walk into their house and eat some of their food or into their yard. And that's where you get like, you know, raccoons and bears and things like that, doing things that are not actually in the best interest of the people that's and true. the animals involved. And so that's, that's one thing. Um, so is it a bad yeah. idea for, cause there's a lot of people that have that feed them, right? They might put food out for deer yeah. or they might feed food out for some like, you know, coyotes and stuff. Is that a bad idea? I mean, the only time I've ever encouraged something like that has been w- is when there's been like significant natural disasters that have just totally screwed up their resources. So like, for example, when we had gnarly fires in Southern California, yeah. I would like on social media, I post like, hey, leave out some, you know, if you can leave out some, some good hay and some water for the deer or for some of the wildlife in your area, that'd be great. Yeah. Like all their resources are depleted, their food and everything has just been completely destroyed. And so, you know, there's nothing wrong in doing a little bit of that. But for like normal wildlife where they have means of, you know, getting what else they need. They figure it out. You know, more or less it's, yeah. I mean, you're just, you're teaching them to get too comfortable to people. You're teaching them potentially to depend on people and then they don't uh, look out, you know, and, and, you know, involve themselves ecologically where they need to be. Uh, You know, there's a whole ecological system where every individual, every individual and every species plays a role Mm -hmm. and we don't want to take away from that or affect that or, or, you know, uh, create a balance there. And then just a real quick thing while we're talking about it, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, when it comes to animals and tourism, you know, because we've been talking about traveling and seeing animals, I, I just want to, you know, really, you, you're probably aware of this, but I want to just, you know, everybody, you know, listening and watching, um, you know, be really hesitant. You know, anytime you see somewhere where you can get a monkey on your shoulder to take a picture or a bird or ride an elephant or have it paint a picture for you or paid to have a chimpanzee do a dance for you or any of that kind of thing, like it's, it's never good. It's never in the best interest of that individual. It's often not the best interest of that species because those animals are poached and they're, you know, the babies are stolen from their mothers in the wild and the rest of the family's killed, kind of like horror stories like that. That's super common. So don't support that kind of tourism because the more you do, the longer it's going to go on. And when people start realizing, hey, this is bad, we don't want to support it, the people that are doing that will stop doing it. They're going to do just what they think can make money. And if they realize this isn't going to make us money, like they're just going to stop doing it. You this know. is an analogy for everything going on in the world right now, to be honest. So I'm so glad you said that because it is through our participation in things that they exist, right? So if there's something out there that you don't agree with and you don't want to continue, you know, let's say, I don't know, let's say you think newspapers are bullshit and the con- you don't know if you should trust the information. Stop buying them. Stop looking yeah. at them. If you think the TV is telling you lies, stop watching the news because as yeah. soon as you stop participating in the systems or an elephant that could paint you a picture, or, you know, a monkey on your shoulder, you, you dissolve, you dissolve it, because this is a, lo- a lovely little lesson, especially at this point in time, and the way everything's going in the world is that we truly hold the power. Yeah, the collective holds the power to make the change in any way that they want. It's just that it takes more than one of us. And so, but yet you have to be the one that makes the decision. So if we each individually decide to make make do things differently and participate in things differently, then we create a different reality for ourselves. So I'm so glad you said that because I think that's such a great like way to, I mean, I I think that there's so many more similarities with animals than we recognize. I mean, what down to genetics, right? So. Oh yeah. 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 No, there's crossover and parallel over the place. And I mean, just like you said, that's what I say to people every time you click or like, or pay for what, I mean, you're voting you're putting your vote out for there. And so you're saying, that's what I want. Even though you don't like it when you watch it or you pay for it or you click on it or whatever, yeah. uh, you just cast your vote. And so if we don't vote for it, you know, they're mm-hmm. not going to do it. They're, you know, like whatever it is, if it's not getting, you know, people aren't voting for it and they're not getting the money they thought they would or whatever it is, you know, it's just, it's going to disappear, but it's going to take yeah. the majority to make this, that decision, you know. That's so great. Thank you for saying that. And thank you so much for sharing about the animals and about your woodwork. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I, I've never done that where I've like gotten up like, oh, let's go check out my wood shop. But I, I'm stoked on it. I'm, I'm glad you took an interest in it too and wanted to see it. And it makes me I day. love that. I'm I really proud it. of you for that. That's, that's so cool um, so and vulnerable too. You're like, um, I like woodworking. Here we go. Yep, pretty <laughs> much. Super stellar. I mean, but you should because look at the, what you've done. Um, oh, and I can't you. wait for my for my cutting board. So cutting board and driving lessons. We've got so much to do and snakes. That's right. I'm not such a snake person. So. The snakes we're both going to benefit from, but I'll get you bored and you, you, you get me behind the wheel. Done. Deal. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.